Now, as we move in to talk specifically about beta diversity, what we're looking at is a comparison between, the between two samples. How do the microbes in those samples overlap? So we do this by plotting the beta diversity in distance uh, metrics. So when I'm talking about distance, what I mean is how similar or different two samples are from each other. Do they share many of the same microorganisms or do they not overlap at all? And we're going to get into how we measure this um, in a second. But first, I just kind of want to show you how this data is going to look. So you may recall from alpha diversity that each sample basically has its own alpha diversity measure. You can add alpha diversity as a column to your metadata because no matter what comparison you're making, the alpha diversity per sample is the same. Just like any other value, like the temperature at which you took the sample or the day since the start of the experiment. But in beta diversity, it is very dependent on which two samples we're comparing. So we end up with a metric, a matrix like this instead. So you'll notice across the top here, we have sample names. We have Stilton, 4R2, 4R3, and then along the rows, we have those same samples, Stilton, 4R2, 4R3. So what we're looking at is the distance those two samples are from each other, how different they are. So these two samples in this top left-hand corner are exactly the same. So you'll see that uh, the distance is zero. They're exactly the same, so there's no difference between them. But if the samples are very different, like maybe if we're comparing these two, we get up to like a, a sample distance of 0.5 or 0.6 even. So again, what we're looking at is a direct comparison between every single sample and every other sample in your entire data set. So as you might imagine, these distance matrix a distance matrix or these different matrices can get very, very large. This is a really small example. There's only like 50 samples in this study. So we don't usually actually look at the distance matrices themselves. We um, kind of visualize them, which we will show you nearer to the end of this presentation. But you may be wondering, where do we get these numbers that go in this distance matrix? So uh, you there's... A lot of different metrics that you can choose to evaluate your beta diversity. So one of the most commonly used metrics uh, that you'll see in literature today is the unifract distance. So here's an example of it. Um, and this is a PCOA plot, which we're going to show you how to make uh, later. But basically, each point is the entire diversity of a single sample. And the closer two points are to each other, the more similar the microbiomes of those samples are to each other. And then we can color them by different metadata to kind of look for patterns in our data. So in this case, we used unifract distances to select the or to uh, measure the distances. So our distance matrix, all of these numbers came from a method called unifrac. And then we plotted them. So you can see that unifrac really separates out the free living organisms versus the uh, vertebrate gut organisms. We don't see a lot of overlap. So the distance between two free living samples is probably pretty small, you know, a 0.1, a 0.2. And the distance between the, the free living and vertebrate gut is much larger. It might be some of those like 0 0.6, 0 0.7 samples. Um, but then if we chose a different metric, and these don't separate the data as well. See, we see kind of some weird patterns along vertical axes. So uh, the choice of metric is really important because it really shapes your data differently. So I'm going to get into just a few of the commonly used methods uh, for calculating the data and kind of how the math works on those and some advantages and disadvantages of each. So uh, the main ones we're going to talk about today are Jacquard, Bray Curtis, unweighted unifrac, weighted unifrac, and generalized unifrac. So unifrac is the, the one we saw on the last slide, but even within that metric, there's a lot of different choices for what you can do. So there are a few rules. So the distance between one sample and another sample has to be either greater than or equal to zero. You can't have negative numbers in these distance matrix. So you'll notice that all of the numbers were zero or above. Also, the difference between sample one and sample two um, 
equals zero if uh, the samples are exactly the same, which is another thing we saw in that example matrix earlier. Um, the distance between sample one and sample two is the same as the distance from sample two to sample one. So it doesn't matter which order we calculate them in, which um, in the distance matrix, you know, each of those comparisons is done twice with the, the diagonal being zero and them being identical across uh, the diagonal. And then the fourth rule is a little bit more confusing. So in this, it's the triangle rule. So what we're saying is, sorry, the distance between sample one and sample two has to be less than the distance between sample one and sample three plus the distance between sample three and sample two. So if you picture these three points plotted out as a triangle um, put up on a graph, the distance between two of the between two points plus another two points has to be greater than like the hypotenuse, which is something that we're used to seeing um, from basic geometry. Don't worry too much about these uh, equations, especially if it's confusing to you. These don't matter as much if to just using and applying the distance uh, metrics. But for me, sometimes knowing the fundamental math behind the decisions we're making um, just helps me understand what we're doing a little bit better. But again, this isn't you know, this isn't going to be on the test, so to speak. You don't need to know this going forward. Um, it's just something to keep in mind. So now we can get in to what some of these actual metrics are. So the first and the most simple metric is Jacquard distance. So if you've already listened to the alpha diversity lecture, uh, you know that the most simple measure of alpha diversity is a richness measure, right? It's just counting the number of different microbes present in a sample. Well, this is kind of the equivalent in beta diversity. So um, the dis it's how many shared microbes are found in each sample. So if you're a visual learner, here's kind of an, a picture of what this looks like, right? If the exact same microbes are found in both samples, the distance is zero. No matter how much of each microbe there are, it's just a count. There's E. coli in both samples, the distance zero. If they, on the other hand, there are no similar microbes between the two samples, our distance is going to be one. They don't overlap at all. And if about half of the microbes in each sample are shared, our distance is 0.5. So this one is really simple and really intuitive, which is nice. Um, and then for those of you that have uh, more mathematical minds, here's kind of how that would work. So um, the equation is one minus the number of features that are in both samples A and B divided by the number that are in A or B, so the total between the two samples. So if this is our, our feature table, so notice this is the, the same table or the same type of table we used in alpha diversity. This is not yet a distance matrix. That's what we're going to make here. And we want to, so we want to compare uh, 4AC2 and E375. I'm just going to say yellow and blue. Um, what we would do is we would count up the total number of features present in each sample. And again, it doesn't matter how often those occur. It doesn't matter what the number in the box is, uh, as long as we know if it's greater than zero. So in this orange or yellow box, we have one, two, three, four features. Um, in this blue box, we have one, two, three, four features. And total, it's going to be five, because all five features are represented. So our denominator here is five. And then we, for our numerator, we um, are counting how many are shared. So feature one is shared, feature two is not. Feature three is shared, feature four is shared, feature five is not. So we have three shared features. So it's one minus three divided by five, and that is what's going to fill into this box here and this box here. Um, and then of course on the diagonal, it's all gonna be zero because we're comparing the sample to itself. Okay, I apologize, I forgot that there were animations. Great, so then this is how that fills in. And because it's a matrix, the other side is going to be exactly the same. Remember, 
uh, rule number three, right, that says the distance between sample one and sample two is the same as the distance between sample two and sample one. So that's what we're looking at here. And um, something that you'll notice about this matrix is that we don't actually see a lot of differences here, right? Our, our distances range from 0.4 to 0.5. Um, there's not a lot of dis things distinguishing the sample. Although if we just glance at this data table, we may think that we're gonna see more differences, especially between this purple sample and some of the others, right? Because this one has a lot more zeros and a lot and of feature three and a few of feature four, whereas um, these others have a lot of feature four and a few of feature three. So maybe in this case, Jakar isn't gonna be the best distance metric to distinguish um, that odd difference of this purple sample here. So in that case, we may want to also include some sort of evenness measure, right? Because the number of sequences associated with each feature might be important to understanding this data set. So if you remember from alpha diversity, to do that, we use the Shannon vector. It includes both distant, both um, richness and evenness. Our beta diversity equivalent is going to be this Bray Curtis difference. So um, for now, go ahead and ignore the math on the bottom here because the equation's a little bit more complicated than it looks. But if we want to just look at the visual building blocks, uh, so to speak, of this of this metric, right? If we have the same, so what we're looking at here is each column is a feature or a bacterium. Um, and the number of squares in a column is how often that feature shows up in a sample. And then we have a blue sample and a red sample here. So if we're comparing blue and red here, we can see they have the exact same features and the same number of, uh, and the same frequency of occurrence of each of those features. So our distance again is zero because these two samples are exactly the same. On the other end, right, these two samples share barely any features, right? We have a, um, we have feature one in the blue sample is not present in the red sample. Feature one in the red, feature two is present in the red sample, but not in the blue sample and so on. Our only overlap is here with feature five and the distance um, where we have three in the blue sample and one occurrence in the red sample. But overall, these are distinct enough from each other that we're calling this distance about one. They barely overlap at all. In, um, and really, the abundance of each of those features is about the same, right? There's a feature with an abundance of four in blue, and there's a feature with an abundance of four in red. So they're not very uneven, even though they have a different richness. Um, and then here in the middle is an example of something that's kind of, that's a distance of 0.5. So more like what we'd probably realistically see, right? There's only a couple samples that come, or features that don't overlap at all. This um, feature three is present in high abundance in blue and not at all in red. And feature five is present in low abundance in red, but not in blue. Feature four is shared between the both. Um, feature two is very similar between the both and feature one is not that different. So what we're seeing here is a distance of 0.5. This one's a little more difficult to see visually, um, but hopefully this math will help you understand it a little better. So this formula looks a little bit more complicated than uh, the last one we saw. So what we're looking at here to break it down is the sum, so add it all together, all of our features together. So X is the frequency of feature I or feature one in sample A minus the frequency of that same feature, feature I in sample B. So what that means is uh, feature one in sample A it might be 42, like this yellow sample, compared to feature one in sample B, which um, here is this blue sample, so that's 12. So 42 minus 12. But then we have to do this for every single feature. So we compare 42, so to get our numerator, it's 42 minus 12, so that's 30, plus zero minus one, so that's negative one, then 37 minus 22 to give us 15, 
99 minus 88, so 11, and then 1 minus 0, which is 1. So we add all of those numbers together, um, and that gives us 56 for our numerator here. And then our denominator is simply a sum of all of the features. So the frequent, this is the opposite, right? It's the sum of the frequency of feature I in sample A plus the frequency of feature I in sample B. So for the denominator, we're doing 42 plus 12 plus 0 plus 1 plus 37 plus 22 plus 99 plus 88 plus 1 plus 0. So that adds up to 302, so you don't have to try to do that math. So when we're comparing uh, yellow sample and blue sample, so filling out this box here, um, we are our math is going to be 56 divided by 302, and that gives us about 0.19. So we would do that comparing all of the samples um, and fill out one side of the distance matrix and then remember the other side's exactly the same. So if we're comparing this, right, back to uh, the distance matrix we saw previously with the Jacquard difference, distance, excuse me, you'll notice that um, we actually see a lot more distinctions between samples here. Remember I was saying it's interesting that we saw really similar distances um, when comparing sample five to the others because it looks different to me. Um, in this case, if we're comparing sample five to the others, we have see a much larger difference, right, uh, compared to the others. Now we're at 0 0.65, 0 0.69, and 0.7, where if we're comparing, you know, sample four and sample one, it's only 0.15. So this is going to show us a lot more distance than, or a lot more differences between samples in this case than the Jacquard difference did. So this is an example of why you might choose Bray Curtis if your sequences are really uneven. Um, if you see similar samples, or if similar features in all of your samples, but at very different frequencies, uh, Bray Curtis might be a better metric. Great. And so now, finally, we've gotten to the unifract distance, which is the one I was teasing in the very beginning. So this distance um, is really valuable because it incorporates uh, phylogenetics. Um, and there are kind of a couple different ways to measure unifrac. The two big ones are unweighted and weighted. And just based on the name, you can probably guess what the difference is. Um, unweighted only measures the richness, so only the presence or absence of features, whereas weighted includes um, the amount or the frequency those features are present. But um, unweighted is usually is um, the one we kind of teach on because it's a little bit easier to understand. So the formula for this is actually quite simple, even though the math is a little more difficult. Um, our formula is just a sum of the unique branch lengths divided by a sum of the observed branch lengths. So this first one here, right, sample one and sample two share all of the same branches. That's why they are in purple over here, because red and blue make purple. All of the branches are shared. Um, so whatever this math ends up being, the top is zero because none of them are unique. And then the bottom is going to be all of these branch lengths added together. Remember, it doesn't matter what these numbers in sample one and sample two are, just whether they're not zero. So that's why this number ends up being zero. Uh, on the other end, we see sample one and sample two don't share any stem, any features, right? So this is kind of similar to that first example we saw in the Jacquard difference, except this is even more valuable because not only do they share no features, they don't even share any branches, right? Sample one and sample two are in two completely different portions of the phylogenetic tree. This is almost like comparing a sample of bacteria versus a sample of archaea. There's no overlap at all um, until a very, very distant common ancestor back here. So our, our unique branch length ends up being the same as observed branch length, right? Because um, every branch that we see is unique. There's no shared, which is how our unweighted unifract distance ends up being one. 
Whereas um, a more middle ground sample, right, sample one and sample two, they still don't really share very many ASVs. Um, if we look for the purple ASVs, which is, uh, again, features, if we look for the purple features, there's only one, two shared features between these two samples. Yet, so our jacquard distance would be very high. It would be very close to one because they don't overlap much. However, in Unifrac, even though they have distinct uh, ASVs are distinct features, they're still really phylogenetically related, right? Feature, so say, for example, look here, sample one has none of ASV4 and sample two has none of ASV5. So those branch lengths are unique that lead right to four and right to five. However, the branch before that where those two diverge um, is shared. So that's why this ends up being about 0.5. Um, and this is kind of what you might see if you are looking, maybe you're looking at a couple of gut samples, right? Where you see really similar gener genera between your two samples, but the actual species happening are, the species that exist, for example, are different. So only the last branches are unique. So that's the general principle of this. Let's do a practice just like we've done with all of the others. So here, um, let's start, like always, by comparing the yellow sample to the blue sample, all right? And I have a little illustration here for you. So again, we're looking for unique branches, right? So both samples have feature one present. It doesn't matter that it's more frequent in the yellow sample. It's present in both. So here's feature one on our phylogenetic tree. Both samples share this branch and both samples, samples share this branch, right? So our unique so far is zero and um, our total, so our denominator is 1.75. Then uh, let's look, go to feature two and feature three over here, right? So both samples have feature three. So both samples share this branch and this branch that leads to feature three However, only the blue sample has feature two. So that last tiny branch going to feature two is our first unique branch length up here on the top. And then feature four is shared. So they both have this branch and they both have this branch to feature four. Only the yellow sample has feature five. So that last little branch is another unique one. So we only have two unique branches um, 0.5 and 0.25. So up here in our numerator is 0.75. Meanwhile, our denominator is going to consist of all of the branches covered by either of these samples. So 1.25 plus 0.5 plus 0.5 plus 0.5 plus 0.6 plus 1.45 plus 0.75 plus 0.25. Um, notice each of those only gets count counted once, even if it's present in both samples. So our denominator there ends up being 5.8. So we're doing 0.75 divided by 5.8, and we get 0.13. And I apologize if it's kind of confusing to just listen to that. If we were doing an in-person workshop, I could um, write these numbers on the board and help you follow along a little better. But the good news, if you don't quite understand um, is that first we have some resources near the end of this section to help you uh, if reading about this instead of listening will help you a little bit better. And secondly, uh, you're never actually going to have to do this math by hand because Chime will do it for you. The main reason we teach the actual formulas is so you understand what this metric is really telling you and you can make an informed decision as to which ones to include in your analysis. Um, Real quick, if we wanted to do another example, we could compare the yellow and the red samples, or sorry, we've switched to purple, yellow and purple samples. Um, and the reason I point this one out is um, because feature two is absent in both yellow and purple, right? So notice here, we don't count that 0.5 branch length at all. Um, it's not unique and it's not shared. So I just want to make it clear that when we count shared branch lengths, we're only capturing the ones present in the samples. It's not like we're counting the entire phylogenetic tree that we made earlier. Um, I hope that makes sense to you. Um, 
but so what's interesting now is that uh, com right if we're comparing yellow if we're comparing yellow and blue our distance is 0.13 and if we're comparing yellow and purple our distance is 0.14 so even though they look different and they were pretty different based on Bray Curtis phylogenetically they're not that different right because um, there's only really one different two different samples here and there's two different samples here and they're all nested within the same phylogenetic tree so once again we've returned to these samples looking very similar to each other even though maybe they aren't so again if we really wanted to distinguish these we might use a weighted or metric or a or a metric that includes evenness so if we wanted a metric that includes evenness and phylogeny we would turn to uh, weighted unifrac. Sorry um, that the top of this slide is not correct. So in this case um, we're just adding in again the evenness metric and we don't even give you the formula for this because it's very confusing and difficult to explain. So um, now instead of this difference being zero it's still very low but it's 0.1 because we do see a difference in the weight. Like if we look at ASV10 it's 170 in sample one and only seven in sample two. So that still is a difference, even if that branch is shared. Um, meanwhile, it's still gonna be one entirely over here because there's still no shared branches. The entire thing is unique. Um, and then in this middle one, um, it's a, the weighted unifrac will skew a little higher again because it's looking at how different the weight is between these two samples. Um, so basically, unweighted unifact biases towards those rare taxa um, because it doesn't matter if it's present with one, with a frequency of one, or it's present with a frequency of 100, it shows up the same in unweighted unifract. Whereas weighted unifract, it really leans heavily on abundant taxa and kind of ignores the rarer ones. So um, these tell you kind of different things about your data, which can be good or bad. But more recently, what some of the Chime developers have started to recommend is this generalized unifrac model. And um, we don't really have a good picture for it, but basically it gives you kind of a medium. So uh, if you are interested in this, you can go to the plugin linked here. Um, we don't really demonstrate it in the uh, tutorial because it's a little bit more advanced. But you can set the alpha level in this uh, plugin to 0.5. So it'll only kind of half weight the unifrac distance, if you will. Um, but really, you can put set that number at anything to just change it just a little bit and give you some uh, more even insight into your data. And we're just putting that there as a resource for you to explore as you dive into your own data later. Um, and there's some good hints about using it on the forum if you have questions. With that, I'm going to turn it back to Yoshiki to talk about how we visualize these uh, distance metrics um, so we can actually gain something out of them since, like I showed you earlier, looking at a distance matrix is actually not super helpful in real world context. Thanks for spending this time with me. Thanks so much, Ariel. Now that we know how to compute distances between samples, and now that we have a better intuition for how to interpret these different distance metrics, let's talk about how can we visualize this. By far, one of the most popular methods to do this is to use principal coordinates analysis. Principal coordinates analysis, or PCOA, is a form of dimensionality reduction where the main input is a distance matrix. This is not to be confused with principal components analysis where the main input is a feature table or contingency matrix. The main implication here being that principal coordinates analysis can operate on matrices in any metric space, whereas principal components analysis can only operate in Euclidean spaces. As Ariel mentioned, um, beta diversity on its own 
does not have any direct relationship to the sample metadata that we collect. If we wanted to do a pre PCOA analysis on a data set and we have no metadata, what we would have to look at is a black and white picture like this one, where the points are distributed along the space, but there's really not much we can do to interpret these uh, data distributions. It is only when we add the sample metadata that we can get to the more interesting results and the more interesting interpretations. In this case, uh, uh, we can see the different sample type effects or the different differences between sample types in panel A or the, the lack of differences between the two, uh, be, be, between uh, the host subjects or the sex of the hosts uh, uh, who donated these samples. And we can also see a little bit of the temporal variability. In general, principal coordinates analysis is not the only way to visualize this data. You can also visualize distributions in, uh, of uh, distances between groups, like in, uh, in panels E and panels F, or even cluster the, the samples or group the samples using a hierarchical clustering scheme to compare the differences between, um, between these samples. As a side note, uh, we've come a very long way in visualizing uh, PCOA, uh, PCOA plots. In 1957, uh, Brian Curtis published this paper uh, where they analyzed the forest communities of southern Wisconsin. And in that, in that paper, they included the following figure where they visualized a three-dimensional PCOA plot that they built with uh, pieces of wood, sticks, and balls. These days, using Chime, this is much easier than it was 70 years ago. One important thing to note about principal coordinates analysis is that this is not a form of uh, statistical testing. If you're interested in doing statistical comparisons, we recommend that you use Permanova, Adonis, or PermDisp for categorical comparisons Mantle's test for continuous uh, uh, univariate comparisons, and Adonis for, multi for other multivariate applications. Uh, in summary, in general, we have two different types of metrics, qualitative metrics and quantitative metrics. Qualitative metrics do not account for the relative abundances of the data that are observed in a sample, and quantitative metrics do. This means that uh, there will be different trade-offs in terms of how low abundance or rare features are represented in, in the end results. In addition, we also have metrics that account and don't account for phylogenetic uh, relationships between uh, the features. Non-phylogenetic uh, metrics assume that everything in your feature table is equally related. Phylogenetic metrics, however, take into account the distance between uh, the, the features in order to assess how different two samples are. Lastly, this is a list of frequently asked questions that we thought it would be beneficial to include. One of the most common questions uh, that we get is, what is the best distance metric and what should I be using for my analysis? The reality is that there is no one single best distance metric. Different metrics account for different properties of the data and you should uh, rely on the interpretation of the metrics to choose what uh, metric you should use for your analysis. Another question that we often get is, um, how do I know what metadata category is the most important in my analysis? Can I assess these alone through a, a PCOA analysis? 
In general, no. You want to uh, use the statistical tests, uh, like the ones we mentioned before, to support any of the results that you may visualize in a PCOA plot. There's a few um, options available in Chime and in other plugins that would uh, let you visualize um, additional access of data on top of these PCOA plots. Biplots are another uh, very useful tool for, for this purpose. One other metric, uh, one other question we get a lot is what other metrics are available in Chime 2? Uh, there really are uh, a few dozen metrics available in Chime 2. If you want to look at this, uh, we recommend that you use uh, the Vera Diversity command with the dash dash p dash metric um, flag, uh, and you will be able to see a list of all of these metrics. For explanations and uh, citations for these metrics, we recommend that you check out this forum post. Thanks so much.